Well, hello, everyone. Shall we get started? My name is Philip Santos. I'm a professor of social entrepreneurship uh, and the Dean of Catholic Lisbon. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh Knowledge at Catholic Lisbon conference, this time dedicated to the topic of responsible business. Now is the time. Before entering into the topic of today, let me say a few words about this Knowledge at Catholic series. Um, a school of business and economics, such as ourselves, has a fundamental role as a convener for knowledge and learning, a meeting point of ideas and people, where the key stakeholders of society gather to discuss and to deepen relevant issues for corporations and for societal progress in collaboration with our academic community. This is why uh, we created the Knowledge and Catholic Conference Series in 2018, and it's great to see you all here. Um, but a, a top research school such as Catholic Lisbon is also a place where advanced knowledge on business and economics is generated. And this is through a combination of high-level research and inspired action. That is what our world-class faculty, many of which are here today, uh, do with researchers every day. Uh, and that is truly distinctive uh, of Catholic Lisbon. Um, but sometimes academic research can be perceived as distant from the needs of societal stakeholders. That's why our knowledge centers are powerful mechanisms to better connect the groundbreaking research and knowledge development to practice and engaging with key stakeholders and launching innovative projects. So we have launched uh, in the last few years a series of knowledge centers, starting in 2016 with the Smart Cities Innovation Lab with Professor René Bonchac, uh, the Chair for Social Entrepreneurship that I launched in 2017, the Center for Technological Innovation and Entrepreneurship in 2018, just to mention uh, some of the more recent and active ones. And today is my great pleasure to launch the new Center for Responsible Business and Leadership. We will not end here in our purpose of changing the world through knowledge and action. Stay tuned as more knowledge centers will be launched in the next few months. But the theme of today's conference and center launch is responsible business. Now is the time. But why is now the time for responsible business? I think we all sense that the world is changing and that the role of corporations needs to change as well. And this is not to be alarmist. It's not to say that the world is falling apart or that we are regressing. If we are fair to the data and if we are objective, in many fundamental indicators, employment, life expectancy, literacy, infant mortality, nutrition, eradication of illnesses and poverty, we have been doing amazing progress in the last decades in Portugal, in Europe, and in the world. However, we all know and sense that profound challenges still exist today, such as promoting social inclusion of specific disadvantaged groups, the issue, for example, of mental, mental well-being, still maybe a taboo in our society, dealing with resource waste, where many of our resource, food and other things are wasted due to bad management and lack of attention. And no doubt, some issues are actually getting worse, such as climate change and migrations leading to refugee crisis, just to mention two of the most visible uh, issues today. But humankind has always progressed by not feeling content or satisfied with the status quo and always pursuing and driving an agenda of change and innovation. So the question, I think, for us is who can lead that change? Who can be the actors that are the front runners of that change process? Social entrepreneurs, a group that I know quite well through my work, um, are doing it around the world, but they often face issues of lack of resources and difficult, difficulty in scaling. Governments can and should do that innovation and change, but they are often paralyzed by size, by bureaucracy, by multiple interests, and face a shortage of resources. Citizens can and do take action, but mobilization and organization of their efforts is not easy. Still, sometimes it happens in powerful ways, 
like recently when, uh, when children in the Nordic countries starting to strike close to school to raise awareness to uh, climate issues. That was an example of citizens, the young ones, taking charge and raising the issues. Um, foundations are important players in the impact agenda, but their available resources are often dwarfed by the scale of the problems to solve. That leaves corporations. Corporations, as we know, are among the most powerful institutions in today's world. Powerful due to the resources they command, their strong brands, marketing and distribution channels, the deep competencies of their staff and technology, their control of many important and growing markets. And business has traditionally been a powerful tool for economic progress. Corporations should be part of the solution, and in many areas, they may be the best solution that we have to key societal problems. And at the same time as they may be the solution, we all sense that the, the, the demands, the expectations imposed on corporations are increasing, from investors, through the movement around sustainable investing, uh, through employees that want to work in companies that are driven by purpose and impact, from clients that require more sustainable products and, par and, uh, and more sustainable brands, and from regulators. We will hear today the thoughts and expectations of some of the new generations. Um, now, how can large corporations transform these demands, these challenges, into opportunities for shared value creation? I think that's exactly the issue that we need to discuss, and that's the issue that brings us here today. And how best to discuss uh, that topic than to bring one of the thought leaders in the world on the topic uh, in the engagement of companies on sustainability issues. So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Stephen Sernils, who traveled yesterday from Amsterdam to be with us and share his views. Um, Steve and I come a long way. We became friends as we worked together uh, since 2015 as board members of the same organization called EVPA, the European Venture Philanthropy Association, which is an organization and, and a network of more than 300 members who aim to develop the practice of social investment across Europe. We work with foundations, with the, uh, social investors, with corporations to drive impact and scale social innovation through financing and support to those innovators. So today, interestingly, uh, I recently became the chair of EVPA, and Steve is the CEO of EVPA. So we have the honor, but also the responsibility of helping drive some of this agenda uh, across Europe, this agenda of impact. Uh, but more than the view of EVPA, Steve will bring his personal and professional experience. He's a successful entrepreneur who built his own business and sold it in 2011. And then in the next cycle of his life, decided to dedicate his career to helping corporations embed impact and sustainability at the core of their strategy, which is exactly the mission that the center that we're launching today is uh, assuming. So it's a pleasure to have Steve with us this evening to share your vision, experience, and passion for responsible business and value creation. Thank you, Steve, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me over here in beautiful Lisbon. Thanks, Philip, for the very nice words. The story I'm going to share tonight with you is very much uh, my personal story. Of course, I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm going to talk about my uh, journey and the insights I got and the good examples I've seen, but also sharing the different companies, the different players that are traveling this journey. And the three topics I'd like to address in the next 20, 25 minutes are, I think that at the end of this presentation, uh, I would hope that you realize if you not already do, that a revolution is going on, that massive change is happening. I happened to be with the CEO of Air Liquide last week in Paris, and he told me, Stephen, three years ago, a lot was kind of going around. We heard a lot of rumors, a lot of issues, but the pressure was not on. Now, 
almost every month this pressure is building. Although I agree with you, Philip, that we are not in a disastrous kind of moment, but at the same time, it is building. And change does not happen gradually. It builds and then it flips over. And he was very conscious about this type. And it's a B2B, which are much further away often from markets. So a revolution is going on. Why today? I'd like to put it in a bigger scheme so that I hope I can share with you this is not just a one-off kind of uh, vanilla flavor of the month. This is something to stay. And the third thing, of course, is what does that mean really for business? What does that mean for you as business leaders? First, I remember we wrote a book a couple of years ago, and one of the graphs that features in there is, as an observation, we see that the organizations that do play a role in our society, they're moving. On the one hand, you clearly see that corporations that had this idea of shareholder management, profit first, profit only, that they rethink their position in society. And they're struggling with the question how to bring back value to environmental issues, social issues, and also ethical issues. And these are some of the names I'm sure you recognize. IKEA is on a big journey of uh, the recycling economy, the circular economy. They try really to envisage how all their furniture over time can be recycled and reused. Unilever household products, they envisage that they're responsible for the whole supply of water from the origin up to the consumer showering. Is he showering two minutes? Is he showering four minutes? Unilever, although not controlling the consumer, starts to feel responsible for also the end consumer using water and their products. Swiss Re, one of the big reinsurance companies, they start to think of why should we not move from paying out risk to preventing risks so that we don't have to pay out, which is a complete different business model. NG, they're in a big transition of not anymore uh, relying on the old energy, but on the renewable energy. This is a massive transformation. And the last one I'd like to mention is Danone. It's one of the key players, definitely in France, but I can say also in Europe and, and beyond Europe. Once that they started meeting Mohamed Yunus so many years ago, they started to think as well, what can Danone do as a business? And they started to redefine their purpose. And redefine their purpose means that they said, we're not a food company anymore. We're a health and well-being company. It's easily said to rethink your purpose. And then the next step was also an easy step. They rebranded their logo, One Planet, One Health. OK, if you put some money there, you have a good designer, you have a new logo. But then they started to realize, what should we do to really live up to this new narrative? They started to sell off some businesses. They started to sell off the beer division. They started to sell off the meat division. They started to sell off the cheese division. Because if you're truly genuine to the idea of not a food company, but a health and well-being company, probably those type of products will not fit anymore in your basket in the future. Then they went to the next step, and they started to realize that we have to learn the other side of the coin. We have to learn society. What is society dealing with? They asked their shareholders to put 100 million coming from the balance sheet in a separate fund to explore innovations where society was at stake. And they started many, many programs from Mexico over Africa, over Europe, to explore how societal challenges and business could come together. It was 100 million coming off the balance sheet, which is big money. They start to re rethink how should we organize our own internal organization. And they had to revise as well the incentive scheme for the management. The management team should not be rewarded anymore on financial performance, but also on social performance. So a lot is happening and is still happening in order to travel the journey. The same, but from a different angle, is happening with what we call the classic nonprofits, the NGOs, the not-for-profit businesses. They start to realize, as Felipe explained, that there is more than just acting in the sake of doing good. We should become entrepreneurial. 
And I had a chance, I was in Amsterdam yesterday, to hear and talk a long time with the CEO of Fairphone. Anyone knows Fairphone? Bas, Bas is the founder, a Dutch guy of Fairphone. And he dropped his phone a certain moment in time, the glass broke, and he said, okay, I should repair the glass. Where are the screws? There are no screws on my phone. So I should hand in my phone. I should buy a new phone because the glass is broken. Wow, that's high consumerism. I just want to replace my glass. And he started to think, what is wrong with my smartphone? On average, we use a smartphone 18 months. Not because it doesn't work anymore, but because probably one feature, probably the camera, is not that good anymore. But all the rest is perfect, it's super. So he started to rethink how we should design a smartphone. Let's design on a modular base. But if you want a new camera, buy a new camera for 45 euros and keep your phone. If you break the glass, just to replace the glass yourself. Go to the shop for 10 euros, buy a glass, put it on. He started to track where is the gold coming from? Where are the minerals coming from? So they started to redesign also how we should see and live and use our smartphones. Now, he aims to produce around 100,000 pieces next year. That's peanuts if you see how many smartphones there are going around in the world. So that's still, but major telecom providers like Vodafone and Orange, they start to be very interested in this new model of not consuming, over-consuming all the time. So that was also a very entrepreneurial start. Of Fairphone, you see others that are on this journey. The good news is that, you know, I always say if the one is on the left-hand side, the not-for-profit is on Mars and the for-profit is on Venus, they don't talk. Different planets, different languages, they can't collaborate. While a lot of social innovation is coming from here, a lot of rigor and scaling is come f coming from the other hand. What if they could work together? If they start to speak their other language, becoming more entrepreneurial, becoming more socially inclusive, they can work together. Another layer which is key, and which I think all business people recognize, is where does the money come from? Because where the money comes from, the type of investor you have, will determine big time also how you behave. This layer of investors is changing as well. Um, the finance only people, they start to also include soci societal dimensions and they start to think how to go beyond only the financial return. This is some initiatives like ESG, the environmental, the social and the govern governmental issues that are more and more applied in this kind of uh, setting. But you see more and more as well those rating agencies that start to screen companies on their sustainability. I don't know whether that's the same for your company, but more and more business leaders get letters from their investors, and they start to rank corporations on their sustainability criteria. Sustainalytics is a big one, Robeco Sam is another one, Bloomberg is another one, and they scrutinize companies on their sustainability, on different dimensions. And they, run, they say, look, if you're not top notch, on sustainability, sorry, but maybe we're not gonna, is that me? Maybe we're not gonna provide you anymore with money because you're too risky, or as the CEO of Danone was telling me, you get a better rate on your financial terms because you're very sustainable. So an immediate kickback also on the financial conditions that you get from those players. You see a couple of them. The letter of Larry Fink from BlackRock became famous. Second time, beginning of this year, he was sending out a letter telling investees, big companies, I know you're there, I know you're on a journey, but be serious. Take it serious because my people will come around and rank you and if you're not sustainable, you're too high risk. You're not gonna get my money anymore. This is happening. This was unconceivable five years ago. And on the other side, the same is happening with grant makers. People providing grants don't suffice anymore by providing the grant. They start asking questions like, what are you gonna do with this grant? 
What is the outcome of this grant? What is the difference, the additionality you make with your grant? What is the impact you create? And even some start there asking, I'm in the game for seven years, but I want an exit as a grant maker. I'm not be there for another 100 years. I want you to build something sustainable that will happen. So also on the financing side, we see those two spectras coming together. They will not converge. They will play their role, but they come together. Second question, why today? I'm going to try to be quick. There's a lot to say. I clearly believe that we're at a moment in time, and it's not coincidence that today, yesterday, tomorrow, we will talk about this. You know, I think all Al Gore, who was very crucial in bringing uh, this to our attention, shifting our mindset that something was happening with CO2 and global warming. We have a similar graph on society. The inequality is growing. Piketty has been, I think, here or in Lisbon some years ago. Very famous French guy that started a discussion on inequality. For me, it's not so much about the inequality of income. It's not so much the inequality of wealth. It's the inequality of opportunities. It's the inequality of hope. And if people start to lose hope because they fell or feel left behind, not only for themselves, but for the next generation, they get disillusioned and they might get angry or both. And if you talk about les gilets jaunes en France, or you talk about other areas, that's what's happening. It's not only the poor people, it's the middle class that is losing hope. And the big question is then, what does that mean for business? Well, first of all, before we go to business, there is a clear relation between people living at the lower side of society and the inconveniences and the poverty and the social non-inclusion of those people. There was a great article a couple of weeks ago in one of the Dutch newspapers where they tracked people with the same IQ, little children, exactly the same IQ, but from parents that were living as laborers and parents that were ranking high class. And they tracked the people over 20 years, and the income was nearly half, same IQ, different starting point. Where is obesitas? Obesitas, Portugal is ranking number two or three in Europe on obesitas. Where is our uh, obesitas? Mainly with the poor people. Clear relation with people at the fringes of society and the social inconvenience. And Christine Lagarde, one of the people that was very inspiring to me, in 2014, together with the IMF, launched a program where she clearly stated there is a clear link between social disruption and e economic, um, uh, economic uh, well-doing. And if a society is disrupted, probably business will follow soon. Business can survive a certain time, but a certain moment in time, the economics of the business will collapse as well. And this is an example where I'd like to say, we've gone through this before. I don't know the godfathers of industry in Portugal, but in Belgium and Holland and France, I can name a few. In UK, the Lever Brothers, in the end of the 19th century, they were keen in providing their employees with good housing, uh, good water, good food, because they knew it was in their self-interest. So only for what I call this altruistic self-interest, businesses should also embrace this inclusion. For me, it's no coincidence that we're celebrating 100 years of the International Labour Organization. For me, it's no coincidence that we're about 100, 120 years beyond Pope Leo XIII, who was writing Rerum Novarum. We now have a Pope who also sizes the moment and understands we have to do something genuine for society altogether. So what's the role then for business? I think for business, when I try to talk to executives in a business environment, I try to bring them, bring them back on the journey for the environment. When I was talking to Nike, the big shoe company, sports company, apparel company, 30 years ago they were the very first in Belgium that were putting up a windmill. 
a very now old-fashioned windmill. And I was asking them, why are you doing so? Why are you putting up a windmill? He said, Stephen, you know we have problems with child labor in Bangladesh. We have to give back something to society. Now we're laughing about this, that there is no connection between putting a windmill and having issues with child labor in Bangladesh. They evolved over time. They're now the first that built a recyclable shoe. So today you can buy shoes from Nike that after they're used, you can put on the waist belt, but they're fully 100% uh, uh, in a circular kind of loop, and they can be reused. And we've gone, I can say today, any company that's not able to measure their CO2 footprint today is seen as a laggard. So we come from 30 years where they put a windmill to compensate child labor issues in Bangladesh to measuring footprints. On the social dimension, we're on the same journey. We start to understand that social inequality, lack of opportunities, social not being inclusive is hampering economics. And the big question indeed is how to turn those challenges, as we did with the Green Revolution, into business opportunities. My prediction is that we will go very soon to a third cycle next to environmental and social, which is ethical. Ethical is paying the right taxes, making a level playing field for taxes. It's the pay slip of the CEO versus the pay slip of the people on the machine. That revolution will come very soon as well. And I'd like, and hence the title of my presentation, to also share a little bit what does that mean? Corporates being on a journey. Corporates embracing social inclusion. Where is the business opportunity? What I see is that companies often start from a risk mitigation perspective. A risk, an, an environment where they say embracing environment, embracing social issues is a cost or is a de risk. So they start to approach it from this perspective. Very soon, they realize that new generation, and we're going to have them very soon on stage, they start to see we have to do something for the new generation and for our employees. So let's take them to the beach, let's clean the beach, or let's bring them to elderly home and spend a day with elderly people so we give back to society. That's what we call risk mitigation, responsive action, which is good, but doesn't really bring business value. We should go beyond that. And beyond risk mitigation is what we call value creation. Just imagine a case where an insurance company starts to support mothers against drunk driving. Mothers against, against drunk driving is a whole movement in the States where mothers losing their young child in a car accident came up and uh, voiced very clearly, I don't want my kids anymore to get drunk and step into a car. And they created this movement. Well, if an insurance company starts to support this kind of movement, it comes closer to their business. Because any insurance company can tell you that the most they pay out for accidents is young kids being drunk, driving a car. So that already comes a bit closer. But you can go even beyond that. And that's what we call business opportunities, inclusive business, shared value. If that same insurance company starts to think about themselves, not anymore as paying out on risk. And let's take the example of diabetes. Diabetes goes together with obesitas. And I'm now talking about diabetes 2. Diabetes 2 can be prevented. Normally, insurance companies are not very keen to have diabetic patients. I can tell you, it costs a lot. It costs maybe three, four times more than a regular patient. If you start to think, how can I prevent diabetes too? How can I make sure that if my members, my, my, my customers move around, get healthy bodies, get healthy minds, I can maybe prevent becoming diabetic too. And what is then the investment in preventing going there versus paying more out at the end? And that's the business case people are building. And that's where it turns into inclusive business. Let me share my last slide, or my last but one slide. The last one is how does it tie in with the financials? There's one vehicle which I think is maybe undervalued as a corporate, which is 
the corporate foundation or the corporate social investor. And I'll share this example of CNA. Leslie Johnston is also on our board. She is the head of the CNA Foundation in uh, CNA worldwide. And when she came on board five, six years ago, the first thing she did is she went to the CEO. And she asked the CEO, what is your strategy? And the CEO said, my strategy is I'd like to have a sustainable supply chain because glitches in my supply chain hamper my markets. I also want to go to sustainable supply because any time we don't get supply, my, again, my supply chain suffers and my financial figures suffer. And she started to think, how can I help my CEO to become sustainable? And one of the initiatives she took is she started an initiative on organic cotton. Because organic cotton is a sustainable product and can also shape a sustainable supply chain. But then she realized, I can't do it on myself. This is just too big. She went to the competition. She teamed up with Inditex, with Zara, with Puma. And all together, they're on a journey to turn this pretty dirty market of textile into organic cotton. What is the advantage of the company? If you talk to the company, they know that running machines with organic cotton is very different and very difficult compared to synthetic cotton. CNA embarked on this journey a long time ago. So if they raise the bar that people have to use more and more organic cotton, CNA as a company has an intrinsic competitive edge because they used to use organic cotton. So that's where corporate foundations with bold, long-term, let's say, very risky money, because they can lose everything, can co-create together with corporations a sustainable environment. As a businessman, I always had this question, when I started, does it trickle down to the bottom line? Does it really show in the numbers? And this, for me, was the most important slide. I was digging into that since 2010. Can I find real, sorry, can I find real evidence that being sustainable, doing good, is also good for business? And this is a study, one of the first that was published by London School of Economics and Harvard. And they did an analysis in two teams. The one team was analyzing the vanguard, the leaders per sector in sustainability. And the other group was analyzing the financials, both on return on assets and on profit. And they come to the conclusion that there is a high correlation in almost every sector, whether it's automotive, whether it's textile, whether it's mining, whether it's consumer product, there is a high correlation between front runners in sustainability and the front runners in profit in shareholder value. And very recently, there was by a big consultant, a very nice report indicating that the most sustainable companies are the most innovative companies. And that's hopeful, because it's innovation, thanks to sustainability, that also will drive the bottom line. Thank you. presented now in the end it's it's really promising and it gives us a lot of hope at least for people that work in this area uh, and my question is simple the the two studies that you referred you told that the first was from someone in LSE and the second uh, a consulting company can you just tell we, uh, which studies are these ones so yeah, Boston consulting group it's the Boston Consulting Group that uh, they have a, a couple of nice studies about walkers and talkers. Walkers are explicitly implementing sustainability. The talkers talk about sustainability. And they see major differences in behavior, organizational design, and so on. But they also made the analysis between innovation and sustainability. So they have a couple of reports on those different topics. So my question is, is a question that is, I think, in a lot of our minds as we look at these studies, 
and think about this issue, which is the issue of, of causality. In a way, are, is it that uh, the best companies with higher performance have more slack and then get more engaged with sustainability issues because they, they can afford it and have the vision? Or is it that because you get engaged in sustainability issues over time, you increase and improve your performance? So that's yeah. the issue of causality is key. Yeah. It's very hard to distinguish. What can you tell us? A question from a professor. Ooh. Um, this same study highlighted that the most innovative companies are not necessarily the most sustainable companies. So it's not because you're innovative that you're sustainable. But they were trying to figure out if you're sustainable, or you then also a front runner in innovation. So it's not a direct answer to your question, but what they kind of were bringing forward is that because you try to be sustainable, you bump into barriers. Because you think about wastewater, how I'm going to reuse wastewater. They think about packaging. How can I use or reuse my packaging? How can I make my product accessible, affordable, and sustainable? We all know consumers will not pay more for sustainable products. It's five, six, seven percent. So we have not to bring the sustainability into the consumer's price. And that requires innovation. Affordable, accessible, and sustainable all together. That's where innovation comes in. Time for one more question? Or? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Speak, yes. Thanks for your presentation. My question is, uh, when you address the issue of impact uh, to shifting uh, businessmen and businesswomen's minds that is needed to create impact, um, and that impact, my, my, my question is whether if these only big companies at the global level can create impact at the global level, and if so, can we uh, influence these big companies to create impact at the local level as well? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's a, a very important um, and very interesting question, which also keeps me uh, awake. Um, two answers to that. First answer is that uh, another consultant was making an analysis. It is true that the global companies are front runners in this kind of area. From a geographical perspective, Europe comes second. So European players are also quite bangers in all this setting. LATAM is also mm -hmm. catching up. US is behind. I'm not talking about the global US companies. I'm talking about the domestic US companies. They're behind. So yeah, we see geographical differences. Now, your question about global and local, there are very, very little data on local companies embracing this concept. We know quite a lot about the big companies. But I regularly bump into terrific small SMEs, small, medium-sized companies that do a terrific job. In Flanders, we were big in textile because, because we had uh, this uh, kind of uh, plant in our, in our neighborhood where we could make textile. And almost all companies, mid-sized companies, went bankrupt, except one. And that company, Catrice, the name is Catrice, uh, um, uh, they managed to, five years ago, they were in a very difficult position. They were capable of making all the fabrics they make 50%, they're not yet at 100%, 50% recyclable, renewable. And that made them survive because the bigger players started to get products from there and not from the others where we were not um, living up to the circular idea. So I see quite a lot of good examples at the SME level but very little data. So, hands up. Whoa. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, when I think of um, global changes, I, I, I naturally have to think of what's happening in the East uh, because of demographics, because of the migration, because of, uh, well, when we look at the value chain of any big company, corporation, or Western corporation, you, you, you have to look East and look at the resources, natural resources, everything. So I wonder if this um, uh, discourse of social responsibility linked with business objectives has to be a different approach in, East, in the East towards uh, uh, comparing with what you're talking about here today for the Western companies. Yeah. 
because they have different realities, different Absolutely. velocities of development, different uh, starting points. So. I can share one personal experience. I was traveling to China, to the Taklamachan Desert, which is very much uh, on the west of China, so not the, the east side. And I was flabbergasted by the number of valleys I saw with windmills and solar panels. It was amazing. If you see nowadays, this is one topical element, which is renewable energy. I'm not an expert. I read a little bit around this. I see it with my own eyes on this theme. I would not be surprised that it will take over leadership on renewable energy in the next five to 10 years. And then they have other big challenges, wastewater, uh, electronic waste, uh, smog, and so on and so forth. So it's a mixed picture. So I think we, we see from, from Steve's presentation, uh, on one hand, the, the urgent need for change, and that change is happening, but also a lot of questions. Questions that many of them can be answered through rigorous research. The issue of, is there evidence that is, is valuable for companies? Is there a causality element that we can discern in the data? How do we do these things? How do we, working with companies, at the middle management level, at the ground level, how do we implement this agenda for change? And how do we launch these socially innovative projects inside large corporations? Do we do that in partnership with social entrepreneurs? Do we do that internally with social investment mechanisms? There is a, a wealth of questions to be explored in this field. And that's exactly uh, some of them we will hear more about in, in the future that the center, that Catholic Lisbon, and the new center wants to explore. Um, and now for the next, for the second part of our event today, which is speaking about the Center for Responsible Business and Leadership and the purpose and plan of action for the center, um, I would like to introduce uh, Nuno Moreira da Cruz, who has been the, the driving force behind the creation of the center. Um, Nuno is an alumnus of uh, Universidade Católica from the law school. Uh, a successful corporate executive with more than 35 years of experience, although he looks very young. He actually has been there working for a long time in companies, in BP, uh, in Galp. Um, and when he retired from his executive life, he decided to dedicate his next cycle of his life to driving this <coughs> impact agenda at the core of the companies that he knows so well. This is not an easy agenda, uh, but I believe that Nuno has the drive, the passion, and the knowledge to succeed in this endeavor and leveraging the knowledge resources at Catholica to help us uh, be pioneering in this issue of the knowledge and practice of responsible business. And before I give the floor to Nunu, I would like to uh, give a special thank you to our uh, founding partners in this adventure, uh, to BP Portugal and to FASEC, two leading companies that decided to partner with, uh, with our school to drive this agenda of responsible business and had the courage of doing it in the early days as founding partners. So to Pedro Oliveira, CEO of VP Portugal, and Angelo Ramalho of FASEC, my thank you in the name of Catholic Lisbon and Universidade Católica Portuguesa. I hope we'll create great things together, a lot of new knowledge on this agenda, and also are able to bring, through your example, new partners to the center, because ours is an agenda of innovation, of learning and sharing, and value creation. So I now call on Nuno to share with his vision and plan of action for the center. Thank you, Nun. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I was not planning to start this way, but you mentioned the word reinventing myself. In fact, that's how I feel. Um, did anybody in this room read a book called A Hundred Years Life from Linda Grayton? Yes, at least one person. You should all read it. It's a great book because basically it says 
with the issue of longevity, we are all going to live 100 years. It's not anymore about learning, working, retire. It's about learning, working, learning, working, and <laughs> maybe you retire one day. So there'll be a moment in your life where you need to reinvent yourself. And that's the stage I'm in. And I'm really having fun. It's like starting a new career. I feel like a trainee. Thank you very much for the mandate you've put in my, my, my hands, Philippe. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to create, try to create some sort of impact. Now, the agenda for the next 15 minutes goes as, as, the, as follows. Uh, I want to share with you what's, what's responsible business. I mean, we are all talking about responsible business. Can we be clear about that? So talk a bit about that. Then I really need and want to reinforce much, uh, most of the things that Steve said, because these things need to be said these days a thousand times. So there are two or three issues that uh, Steve mentioned that I want to reinforce that with my slides. And finally, I mean, tell you, of course, what the most important is what are we going to do, uh, uh, hopefully, in the near future with this center. Now, so strategy and call for action, that's the name of the, uh, of the game. So two possible definitions. And I've highlighted um, the, the four key words, if you want, uh, that go with the definition. First of all, is, is, it's about being core in their business. So sustainability. There is, I, I always say this, I don't believe in sustainable strategies. Sustainability is the strategy. Because if we don't see it with this way, we are missing something. So being in the core of the strategy is fundamental when we talk about responsible business. Stakeholders. I mean, my generation, we have grown up with this idea of it's all about maximizing shareholder profit, right? So that was my generation. And we are talking about a different world that takes us to a different place, which is about stakeholders. It's about this all holistic approach to whatever we want to do in the, in the marketplace. Culture is fundamental, it needs to go with this, because without the culture, we cannot do uh, whatever. It's, it's the agenda and share value. Creating value for the company and for society is what is really changing in this new world. Now. I love this because this helps me a lot to communicate with students and to communicate with executives. And it's important that we understand what's responsible business. And this was said by a CEO of a, a big uh, Spanish company. And he said, uh, I'm very clear that I'm not going to sell sh shirts anymore. Either I sell sustainable shirts or I don't sell shirts at all. Now let me tell you what's a sustainable shirt. Sustainable shirt, it's not about proving that I'm saving water. Or, or green chemicals, that's license to operate in these days. It's the minimum I have to do. What I need to do is to be able to prove that I don't discriminate men and women, that I don't exploit the children somewhere in Cambodia, that I have clear lines of communication and fair lines of communication with my customers, that in the local communities, wherever I take out the communities, I put it back. That's a sustainable shirt. And that's the challenge that for most of the, the companies and CEOs need to understand what we are talking about. It's not anymore about environment at all. And I, I always say this. Uh, I, I see um, sustainability uh, having two daughters. One daughter is called environment, and the other daughter is called social. Environment is 10 years older than the system. Environment, I mean, nobody doubts about what's going on with the environment. In terms of the social dimension, there is a lot to be done. And that's, I believe, the key challenge. So how did we get here? Uh, Steve mentioned these things. I'm not going to repeat this. But this is, if I had to show one slide and one slide alone, uh, Steve showed you the slide of Al Gore. This is the slide. Because if you go in each some of the floods, droughts, wildfires, extreme temperatures, I mean, you don't need to be a genius to understand these slides and the problem that is. So that's why I say that the environment is 10 years older than social, because everybody it's something, an unavoidable agenda to understand that climate change is taking us to the extreme of what needs to be done. And we have the perfect storm, right? I mean, 8 billion people in 2002 it means all of that. And at the same time, we have to deliver berries and the rest of it. So the challenge is tremendous, and the storm is there. So environment, the agenda is very clear what needs to be done. Now, but it's much more than environment, right? It's everything that's in there that I was talking about. All of these things, as, as, as Philippe was saying at the beginning, in most of these dimensions, there was huge, huge 
increase in most of the situations, but it's not enough. The planet is not for, there for us anymore. GDP growth took us out of poverty and things like that, but at the same time was biting the planet. So the dimension that we need to understand is that GDP made a lot for us, but also created the problem because nobody was putting costs on that. So it meant that we have a situation where uh, uh, that thing that was always there for us is not for there for us anymore. Business ethics, we know what's happened, so I, I'm not going to talk about that. But there's the issue of credibility to most of the companies, and we, we, know, we know that thing. So what was the journey so far for companies? Uh, Steve expressed it in a way, expressed it in another way, which is everything starts with philanthropy. Then there was a second level of development, which is about risk mitigation, understanding. I mean, the Nikes of this world, uh, I mean, if, if there is a problem with uh, my factory where I'm exploiting children, then I will have a problem. So it's about risk mitigation. I need to be careful. It's about bottom line. And third, it's about value creation. I mean, I'm creating value for me and for the companies. Now, in other words, I mean, sometimes we lose a bit of memory. It was only 20 years ago that the oil companies were brave. First, the first CEO to be able to say that was the CEO of BP at the time that said, I don't know whether science is right or wrong, but I don't risk. And I will take a step forward in terms to, to deal with climate change. This was only 20 years ago. Most of the oil companies, I, of course, I put their shell. I, of course, I wouldn't dare to put BP or Gulp because they have fed my family for a long time, so I wouldn't put that. I would put Shell or another one, but at the end of the day, it's all the same. So it best was where everything, very defensive. Then this the thing of compliant. I mean, this was 15 years ago. Uh, there was an issue with Nestle, and I, I tell this story because I think it's very illustrative. Uh, they, they, you know, the, the, one of the star products they have is a powder that you put water on it and you feed uh, young born kids. Uh, I took that in class, right? <laughs> Looking at me. Um, I mean, at the time, two babies died. And uh, the question was, uh, I mean, what happened to the kid? Of course, they proved that the powder was fantastic. The problem was the water. And the CEO at the time said, as you see, it's not our problem. I mean, the powder is fantastic. It's the water they use. I mean, can you imagine today the CEO of Nestle saying something? I and mean, this was only 50 years ago. I mean, things have moved a long way. Managerial, of course, that was the next, next level. Of it. It's about understanding that we're talking about the bottom line, uh, the, the, what I was saying, I mean, if I'm exploiting children in my factories building, doing shoes, I have a problem. And finally, I mean, there is the strategic way, which is uh, the, the, the likes of Toyota that saw things like the electric car coming. And so there was this perspective, which is much more from the strategic level. Now, is there a business case for action? Now, if this will take us for two hours, and of course, we don't have the time. I want to to raise one single letter. And Steve already mentioned that. These letters changed everything, in my view. The first letter was January 2018. So for those that were saying, uh, this, we are talking about Larry Fink, which is most hard hedge manager you can imagine. So this is not Mother Teresa of Calcutta talking, right? He was saying it's about sense of purpose. I'm telling you, CEOs, that uh, short-term performance, this is great and there is minimum I, I expect. But either you deliver on environment, social, government metrics, or you are not sustainable, so I'm not carry on investing. And he sent that letter to all the CEOs around the world. It doesn't matter whether he has majority of votes or not. Two percent. Many companies here received Gulp, Jeronim Martins. I mean, you don't dare to not take this seriously, even if this guy is only 2% of the companies. They say in Wall Street there was one before and one after the letter. And in fact, in 2018, what we have seen is a lot of companies rethinking the strategies they have. Everybody thought this, this was just a moment of madness that the guy had. Well, then he, he came with 2019, it's exactly the same. It's even harder, the, the letter that, that he held. And he, he, in fact, the title is Purpose Versus Profit. So if you haven't read the letter, I suggest you read it. So business case for action, there are many studies. Steve mentioned one of BCG, where they talk about total social total impact, which is something that a uh, new measure they are coming with. But I mean, we have Bain in the room, and Bain has also fantastic studies on this. I mean, there are lots of studies from Stanford recently. Nielsen provides a lot of reports proving the case. 
uh, you go in Unilever, they have a lot of, of, uh, of studies that they search in terms of B2C, and the case is becoming more and more clear. Now, in this context, with all this in mind, I'm always struggling to understand where should I point, I guess this is, I mean, now is the time to think responsible business strategically, now is the time for call for action, <coughs> and now is the time to launch the, the center. <coughs> Now, so what are we trying to achieve? Um, purpose is becoming, as you have all seen, purpose is becoming the, the fashionable word. Uh, everybody talks about purpose these days. So then people get confused about what is purpose, what is vision, what is mission. I tell you what I, how I see it. I mean, purpose is why you do the things, vision is where we want to go, and mission is what you do. So with these things in mind, it's much easier to understand what are we trying to design as a center. This is our purpose. We would love to believe that we could contribute to society. That's why what moves us is to contribute to this, to the, to, to the way we do things in our organizations, in our, in our life. It's good to have a purpose and understand what we are doing. A vision is a very, very uh, ambitious one. I mean, I'm talking about reference in Europe, very easy to say, very hard to do. And it's certainly not a, a, a man's job. It's not something to be done tomorrow. It's a process. It's a way. But it's, we need to set ambitions to get there. And we want to take this very, very serious. So um, we will certainly knock on many doors around the room to make sure that we are able to, together, try to bring something different. <clears throat> These are the things we are, we are going to do uh, through research, teaching, and consulting try to, to, to deliver this, this sort of agenda. <clears throat> now, the, the intervention will happen at four different levels. The first one is uh, this sort of university degrees. We already have uh, at least one, one, one module which is clear addressing this, which is called corporate social responsibility. But there are many other modules that are very successful in school here, which are very linked to, to the topic. And uh, we need to see whether we can do more or not in terms of understanding what's the right path to make the future leaders of tomorrow, because that's what this is about. Future leaders of tomorrow, putting that really in their agenda when they start uh, their professional lives. The second one is about executives, is today's leaders. <clears throat> uh, we have just launched, and I have the privilege of having many participants of the first open course here in the room. Uh, we have launched the first uh, open course in a, it's a really, it's called Responsible Business. Uh, we'll have the second edition in a few months. And that's the sort of thing that we want to do. Uh, and also, at the same time, work uh, within the companies, try to understand what's the agenda they have and how can we help, if we can help, uh, the, the drive those agendas. The third one, it's probably one of the, the key ones, it's uh, trying to have this sort of research. Re the questions just are two examples, but we really need to work more on this to understand exactly what they are trying to research. We need the help of the partners to understand exactly what we will be researching, uh, but that's the, 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 the agenda that's to be fixed uh, in, since the beginning. And finally, consulting on responsibility. We already are doing that in two companies. <clears throat> one started uh, last month, the other one will start in September, and it's about exactly defining the strategy for this. I help them define the strategy in terms of, uh, of, of, of um, responsible business. And I would like to to finish with this, which I believe, uh, strongly believe in this, and I li li leave you to, 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 to read it. I don't need to read it. And I just say that uh, we also believe in this uh, in, in terms of Catholic. So it's, a, it's a, an ambitious agenda, a long way to, to do, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I, I truly believe that we can do it. It's a question of passion, as, as Philippe was saying, it's a question of passion and energy to make the point. Which is something I have. Thank you. <laughs> Thirteen minutes, fantastic. Now I would like I would like to have in the stage with me my, my our uh, two sponsors. So I would like Angelo, Angelo and Pedro, if you don't mind, to join me here. <clears throat> Um, 
I mean, we are talking about two companies that everybody in the room knows. <coughs> it's companies that are, well, the sort of markets where they are, it's certainly not only Portugal. Uh, BP is all over the place. FASEC these days is all over the place as well. Companies which are very, very serious when we talk about sustainability. And as you can imagine, coming specifically for BP, coming from the oil world, uh, try to be a sustainable company is a challenge. And uh, I'm sure Pedro will not avoid the question if, it's, if that is the question. Uh, but these companies that really take it very, very seriously. And so it's a huge privilege to have them with us. Uh, they have solid management processes. And that's very key to us to have partners that help us um, uh, to steer, do, steer the way. And I know on the top of that, the, the two CEOs that I have uh, by my side are two very, very hard hedge guys that understand what needs to be done. So I don't know where to start. You start with letter B, with the E, so I start with you. Uh, Pedro, Pedro Oliveira, is, is, uh, is, uh, he has a fantastic career in BP. He has been all over the place, mainly in Iberia, Pedro. Pedro, uh, we were, uh, happened to have to work together in the past. Uh, and Pedro has, has uh, specifically worked in downstream. Uh, is um, a very respected leader, and there are many people here in BP that know what I'm talking about. Uh, he's becoming a, a sort of a, a total leader, as I call, because he's a leader in the company, he's a leader in the society, because he has, he's becoming an opinion maker in what he does, and he's also a leader at home. And, and don't try to fight him, because this guy was national champion in judo, and on the top of that, two years ago, he was third place world champion of veterans. So, I mean, don't dare to fight him. Uh, Pedro, I have to, one question for, for Pedro, one question for, for Angelo, and then we'll go. If you don't mind, I present them, Pedro, and then I go to you. Uh, Pedro, the question is basically the same, which is, I mean, how does BP see these things moving? And then wh wh why are you sponsoring the, the, this? Ramone, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. It's definitely a pleasure to be, to be around with you guys this, uh, this evening. Well, first of all, and regarding some comments you did uh, regarding uh, BP, myself, etc., there is definitely one which is not correct. I'm not a leader at home. Is this some sort of... sure. No, it was not. No, it is. Okay, so could you, could you listen to me, yeah? Okay, so um, why is BP... Why is BP supporting uh, these initiatives. Um, basically, and you touched the point um, some, some, some minutes ago, uh, in spite of uh, working in, um, in an area which is quite sensitive in terms of uh, environment, our CEO at the time in 1997, uh, Lord Brown, in a speech he gave in Stanford, um, he actually was the first one within this industry raising his hand and saying that um, there was an issue uh, related with the environment. We were not sure about it, but um, as Nuno was saying, uh, there was no point on trying to avoid, and so we definitely should take it very, very, very seriously. So it was almost 23 years ago, a company like BP uh, raising global awareness uh, regarding climate change. So that was definitely when the, that journey started, and the BP as a corporate um, entity started either in the outside world and in the inside of, um, of in-house, uh, building an agenda around sustainability. Of course, we are tempted to limit that agenda to, um, to climate change, but uh, the BP agenda around sustainability goes far beyond uh, climate change as a global player as, as we are. Uh, I have to confess you that personally, uh, this is an agenda that I'm, I, I'm really a fan of, because if there is a word uh, that we could use, which in my opinion is common to all this agenda, is courage. Um, courage should be there um, in, in all aspects about sustainability. The courage to raise awareness, even if we are not uh, the best well-behaved operator in the world, but having the courage to be part of the solution and saying that we are going to be part of the solution. Having the courage to, as it has been said during the presentations, that no matter what, and we have to be very pragmatic about this one, we have to sacrifice short-term results in order to build real, and sorry for the redundancy, 
sustainable sustainability. Um, we should not fool ourselves. It is definitely about compromising short term in order to enhance long term. So it is again about about courage. And um, and one of BP values, and we have our values very well stated and uh, totally identified, is um, is courage. And so um, sustainability for us is definitely about walking the talk about one of our core values. So uh, it is in our DNA. We have been around uh, speaking about this and acting around this one. And we may get into details when, uh, when, when in uh, Q&As. Um, so it is really in our DNA and uh, we have to walk the talk. Then there is a second and more local dimension regarding why we are sponsoring this one. So this is about courage, it is about leadership and it is about credibility. Um, I know you, as you were saying, uh, you know, these things only happen when there are driving forces behind it. Um, you are a leader, I know, you have that credibility with Catholic uh, Business School, where I also was privileged to study. Um, and so with all those elements together, uh, I'm sure this is, this is going to be a very successful initiative. So all the best. Thank you. All the best to all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Angelo. Angelo is the, currently the CEO of FASEC. Angelo uh, is an engineer, so nobody's perfect. He's right? <laughs> an engineer from, from El Porto, right? Yeah. From El Porto. Angelo has a long career as well, some of, the, some of them in, in energy. I mean, he comes from Shell. If I, I could have remembered that and they put another company in there. You worked in, 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 in gas. You were the CEO of Alston until 2009 or 15. And then for the last three years, uh, Angelo is the CEO of FASEC, and it's really a, a company, I don't know whether you follow or not, FASEC, that is really driving the agenda, specifically the, the mobility agenda, with a, a, a presence all over the world these days, right, Angelo? So how do you see all of this? Thank you, Nuno. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I can say that we are great guys. Um, we are living. We are living. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. We are living a silent turmoil, um, trying to tackle with uh, a few big issues. A few big issues. One of uh, one of them. Um, one of them uh, related with the environment and to sustain uh, the global temperature to rise no no more than. Uh, than two, two degrees. Um, um, regarding this, um, we are living this uh, kind of silent re revolution in the um, energy sectors um, that are impacting um, mobility, mobility sectors. Um, um, and um, we are lucky, well, to be lucky, uh, it's a hard job. Uh, because we have, we have uh, since um, our very beginning, um, we have been working in two sectors, and recently a, th a, th a third other sector: sector, uh, energy, environment, and uh, mobility. Um, in energy business, uh, we are assisting and we are promoting uh, something that is that is really new that is really challenging, that is to switch from big central power production, production uh, based on um, um, heavy fuel oil and other um, 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 uh, um, heavy, heavy, heavy uh, products, switching to uh, distributed productive energy based on renewable and uh, tackle with this uh, challenge and this with t um, change uh, of situation it, it is uh, to tackle with this we need uh, new technologies and the FASEC is being um, on the center of this process of delivering new technologies to to allow uh, this uh, uh, new life uh, with uh, better and uh, uh, low impacting um, energy and of course, uh, having said this, said this, sustainability is in the core. Uh, we could present us as a knowledge organization that um, we um, 
transfer from technologies that we incorporate in products, that we incorporate in systems, and knowledge is in people, and what we do is directly related with people. So from people to people, to create uh, intelligent solutions for a better life, it's our purpose. So sustainability is with us, and uh, in the very end, it is our business. Mm -hmm. So to be here today, um, it's in the very end our utmost interest, and as Pedro said, it's the kind of stress and credi credibility related with, with uh, all our stakeholders. Okay. Okay, well, is there any questions for, for this gentleman? If there is no questions, we will move on. Uh, Pedro, any last comment? No. No? Angel? No. No? Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> now, I have the privilege of introducing to you my two best students. Isabel and Madalena, uh, they were uh, in my class uh, in September last year, and I've challenged them to come and tell us what uh, this new generation expects from most of us, and they took on board the challenge. You are already on holidays, thanks very much for stopping your holidays for a while, and so if you don't mind, the, the floor is yours. What's from Florida? Hi, and yeah, that's what it is. Hi, and welcome everyone. First of all, Nuno, thank you so much for granting us the time here today and for being able to be on stage. Um, so basically, my friend Madalena and I, my name is Isabel, we are former students of Nuno's um, Corporate Social Responsibility class. For all the students here in the room, I advise you to take it. It's a really easy way to get a good grade. And <laughs> also quite worthwhile. Um, and yeah, he invited us to be on stage and uh, yeah, as he mentioned, we took on the challenge because, as mentioned before, this new center is supposed to be kind of like setting the right tone in terms of um, responsible business, in terms of ethical and societal behavior, and to lead as an example for future generations and for all the businesses are, that are yet uh, to be made in this world. And uh, we decided to talk a little bit about about the infamous ge generation, the millennials, and uh, what we think should be the way that we would like things to be done around here. So that's what we're gonna present today, and I'm gonna hand this over to my friend. Well, I will start by, no. <laughs> Sorry. I'll start by giving you uh, an idea of what the students in Catholic are, and for that I chose an object that reminds me of every classroom of this university. You've seen it before, but it's okay. <laughs> Um, because I've seen it uh, every day throughout this year. That is this one. It doesn't have to be specifically this one. It can be more like this or like this or of any kind you can imagine. There are one for every style and for every taste and I've seen them all in this university. And we don't see, uh, so every student has uh, usually two things on, on their table, their laptop and their reusable bottle of water. And we don't see plastic that much anymore. And I'm pretty sure we all still buy some bottles sometimes when we forget ours and we can see the vending machines are full of them. But we just, we, ch we choose not to put them on our table. We prefer to keep it in our bags because we know it does not look good. And it does not look good because it does not do good. So, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's alri there's already this, uh, let's call it sustainable uh, peer pressure in the air. It's very subtle, but it's already here. And so the question again is, what does this generation of sustainable peer pressures expect from companies? All right, and in order to spice up the presentation a little bit, um, and also maybe to use the time on stage to defend some of the negative stigma that's out there about our generation. We came up with this with a few slides on like uh, myth, myth versus reality on millennials. And uh, I'm going to start off with the first one. 
which is uh, basically that all that ma matters to us is money and uh, career opportunities. And yeah, to be quite frank, I mean, we gotta be honest, we grew up in a, in a world where we were lucky enough that we didn't have to deal with the repercussions of post-war situations other than, you know, let's say our grandparents and even our parents. So in a way, yes, we are very blessed, we're very spoiled, but we also grew up in a, in a time where we had to deal with the financial crisis. Right now, we're um, uh, dealing with the fact that we might never actually own property because it's just absolutely <laughs> inaffordable. And uh, so, yeah, as a matter of fact, I believe that what's actually happening out there right now is that our generation, um, it's become a really, really important driver to uh, see some, some, some sort of sense of purpose, not just in your daily life and in the talks with your friends, but also with respect to the company that we work for. And uh, so yeah, Larry Fink that we've heard, or that we've been mentioning before, um, has stated that purpose is not the sole pursuit of profits, but the animating force for achieving them. And uh, to be honest, I can absolutely relate to that, and I believe that that is actually one of the key drivers why I decided as a German person to stick around and to stay here, because when mm, the company that I'm working for right now approached me, I was, I was really considering you know, all the whereabouts, and uh, one of the key reasons why I decided to stick around, to maybe give up on a little bit of, of money and maybe career opportunities was the fact that I can see a pure and sole purpose as at really at the core of uh, what my company stands for. And that's a really, really big driver for our generation nowadays. And it, it helps us to like work a little harder and yeah, maybe compensates for, for other incentives that used to matter a lot more. And uh, so yeah, there's a study by Deloitte that actually totally supports what I just mentioned as well, as well where they were asking a number of participants uh, what should be the primary purpose of business. And uh, yeah, what it shows is that not just B completely overruled A, but it totally overruled it by 63%, which is quite representative after all. And, uh, let's see. Then another myth about our generation is that, oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, no, you see this. <laughs> is that we only fight for the environment. We are the generation known for the fight uh, against the plastic straws. It might have been a bit uh, taken to an extreme. Uh, and there's a lot of public... Um, um, I don't know, do you remember the word, but the public uh, against pollution. So that's the, the topic that is mostly talked about, and Nunu t said that. Uh, just before, that is just not about the environment. We do care about all the other social problems. Uh, here are the sustainable development goals that uh, include most of the, all the environmental and social problems that we do care about, and then we expect our employer to also care about that. And we do not feel good about we cannot feel good about ourselves and produce good work if we do if we do not agree or feel ashamed about something that our company is doing, and we like to be informed about everything that's going on in the company we work for, and we must agree with it so we, we can feel fu uh, fulfilled and we can enjoy and produce good work. Then another thing is that this idea that we want fun facilities, on-site massages, and avocado toasts. <laughs> We found a pretty accurate fun tweet about this when he says millennials want to open office spaces and then we say, no, we want to be compensated for our labor. And then a baby boomer say, no, you want bean bench chairs. <laughs> and well, and here is an image of a Google office. And of course, we all like these perks and to have a fun uh, facility with ping pong tables and everything. Uh, of course, we like it, but the truth is th those are just superficial incentives. And what really matters and I'll quote the student, is to understand why my work matters. I want to know what world I'm helping to build. And that's what tru truly motivates us. Um, sorry. And quoting Paul, Paul, Paul Polman, purpose-driven actions see the best results. And that is something that no massages or fun facilities or toasts can give us. All right. Um, one of my favorite ones. So millennials are lazy, self-centered, and inconsiderate. Let me tell you something. I'm pretty sure I've done that before. And uh, I'm pretty sure all of, have had all of us have done that before. So in a way, it's very true. Like, we're lazy. We're always on our phones. It's, it's a matter of fact. But on the other hand, we're not just a generation who invented the selfie stick and who made a bunch of really fairly untalented bloggers really famous. But we also the 
so, uh, the generation that does, as mentioned before, I, I love that, that invented ocean cleanups as like a thing that we do on the weekends. And uh, it's really, it's, um, so what, what's really the reality is that we expect this responsible business to be at the core of a business strategy. And uh, I'm not gonna read all of this, but yeah, and basically what uh, one of the managing directors at Shell has said is that in my view, the successful companies of the future will be those that integrate business and employees' personal values. The best people want to do work that contributes to society with a company. So really, it's the best people. If you guys want great talent, then you gotta set the right incentives as well. And one of them is definitely having you know, a purpose at the core of its values. And uh, here, for instance, just to represent that again, is like you can see a, a, a climate run organized by JP Morgan. And uh, I think, yeah, we're a generation that really knows what this world is all about and that we've got a great planet and that we got to put up all the fight that we have in order to protect it. And uh, I hate running, but I probably even would have participated in that one. And uh, yeah, next one, uh, responsible business is a p pure marketing tool which is costly and ineffective. Uh, I, funnily enough, just had this discussion with my dad this weekend that he still believes that it's it's a fairly like superficial PR tool where you just do this kind of like greenwashing and you know make sure that the company looks all nice and shiny and polished from the outside, but that it's that it's really yeah it it can't do much. But as a matter of fact, and that's really something that Nuna has taught us in class as well. There's this big fuss about the the nice sentence of like doing doing well by doing good. And this sentence doesn't just only sound good, it also means a lot and it should really resituate in our minds because I am an absolute believer of this and um, there's a number of companies that has shown that this is actually the truth and uh, yeah, I hope that it's gonna continue to be the truth and you can try and write. Now there's another thing about uh, how we only care about quality and price. This goes for our generation, I think for all the generations, that as, as consumers only care about promotions and about the quality of products. But this has changed and the reality is that reputation and ethical positioning are important drivers for millennials. And that is why brands as Patagonia are so valuable for us. And this goes for our decision as consumers of what to buy and also for our decisions of which companies we choose we want to work for. Uh, so reputation and ethical positioning are being more and more an important driver. Then the last myth that we bring to you uh, is that only some countries are doing something about this. That when, you think about, when we think about sustainability, we think of the Nordic countries, of the Netherlands, Germany, the UK, uh, and that the rest of the world is still lagging behind. Uh, but the truth is that Portugal and the rest of the world is also taking its steps. And the creation of this center is a great example of that. Uh, of a path towards responsible business. And then we brought you some news headlines. It's in Portuguese, but about some great news that showed us that great things are already being done and that we should look forward for the future. Thank you very much. This has been the most on-time event that I've ever been at Catholica. Things are precisely at the time they are scheduled. We also had some nice moments in the event. One was the Dean not walking the talk and bringing the plastic bottle to an event on sustainability, which shows you some things that uh, old habits die hard, that change is difficult, but also to my defense, this is my reusable bottle. This is what I use and reuse many times. So I escaped that one. Um, we also had another fun moment where the lawyer in the room turned to the engineer in the room and said, no one is perfect. That's what we typically say to the lawyers. Um, but now, more seriously, uh, this is the start of, a, a, of an adventure. This is the start of a path that we want to develop together with all of you. So we invited you to be here because new knowledge, new practices, new innovation on how to integrate sustainability and impact considerations at the core 
of corporations and business only happens if we engage with all of the stakeholders. The corporate leaders, the new generations, the middle management, the academics, together in a journey towards impact. That's the journey that we are starting today uh, with the launch of the center on this domain. And so we'll now have a cocktail uh, outside. And the cocktail is also an opportunity for us to, to network, to share with each other. Um, and also come to us, to me, to Nuno, to, to other people from, from Catolica, with your ideas, with your suggestions. We are now open for business in a way, in the sense of what we could do with you in terms of driving this agenda forward. Thank you very much for your presence here. Also, thank you for our institutional marketing team for organizing this event so well. Thank you very much, and let's walk this path together. Thank you.